So how's everybody doing? There you go. That's going to change the movement right there. Uh, I have the honor of moderating the final plenary, popularizing racial justice, building clarity, unity, and strategy to move us forward. Um, I'm going to introduce this incredible panel, uh, and then I'm going to tell you about the format, and then I'm actually going to take a seat. Uh, to my left, we always start to my left, is Rinku Sin, who is the President and Executive Director of the Applied Research Center. and publisher of Colorlines.com. <clears throat> As we all know, she's a leading figure in the racial justice movement with extensive expertise in feminism, immigration, economic justice, philanthropy, and journalism. Her latest book, The Accidental American, Immigration and Citizenship in the Age of Globalization, won the Nautilus Book Award uh, Silver Medal. So thank you, Renku. The, yep. Uh, next on the panel is Van Jones. It's funny, I've known all the, most, a lot of these people since they were young, and I was young actually. Um, <laughs> we were all young, so young. it's hard to believe, that's right. <clears throat> Van is a globally recognized, award-winning pioneer in human rights and the clean energy economy. Van, yeah, okay, all right now. <laughs> I know we could clap for every sentence, but we only have a limited amount of time, so. <laughs> Van is the co-founder of three successful nonprofit organizations, the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, Color of Change, and Green for All. He is the best-selling author of the definitive book on green jobs, The Green Collar Economy. He served as the Green Jobs Advisor in the Obama White House in 2009. And we'll get back to that. Um, <laughs> Uh, next on the panel, it's going to be fun, folks, I promise you, <laughs> is Maria Teresa Kumar. She is the founding executive director of Voto Latino and was named Poder Magazine as one of the most notable 20 U.S. Hispanics under 40 years old. In addition to on-air appearances, Maria Teresa serves as an occasional blogger. She is a recipient of numerous leadership awards, including from the White House Project and the New York Legislature. And uh, for our token white person on the panel. <laughs> Gotta have one. Uh, I'm surprisingly okay with that. <laughs> I bet you are. <laughs> You always got to have one, so. Uh, <laughs> Tim Wise is among the most prominent anti-racist writers and educators in the United States. What? what? <laughs> Wise is the author of five books, including his latest, Colorblind, The Rise of Post-Racial Politics and the Retreat from Racial Equality. Wise has appeared on hundreds of radio and television programs and is a regular contributor to discussions about race on CNN. So that's our panel for today. So lucky for us, we've brought together some of the most exciting, creative, and really strategic thinkers in our movement for racial justice. So today we're gonna to have a chance to hear from them, uh, but we also wanna make sure that folks in the room have a chance to participate in this conversation. So as you've done throughout the conference, if you have a question, if you can write it down on an index card, a napkin, a piece of paper, whatever you have, raise your hand, one of the volunteers will come through the crowd and pick up the card, and eventually it will come to me and I'll try to read it. Uh, but the real goal here is to have a conversation with these four, let them talk to each other, and then a conversation between the folks on the stage and the folks in the room. So I'm now gonna move over here, okay? Can everybody still hear me? All right, so the, the first question is a pretty easy one, I think, uh, and I love the first question, which is, what is the thing that kind of pisses you off most uh, right now about the racial discourse, or the lack of racial discourse in this country? Who wants to go first? <laughs> Van? No, <I'm> <laughs> Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, so, 
I think what pisses me off the most is <laughs> that, um, well, there are many things, but the one that I will pick so that I leave something for my colleagues to say is that um, the people who talk the most about race are uh, racist conservatives. And so they get to frame the entire discussion and uh, to the degree that um, that liberals are could intervene in that discussion, they don't. So what you have is a lot of uh, right-wing noise on race that individualizes the problem. If they admit that there's any kind of issue, it's always a, it's always a something that just lives in p individual people's brains. It has no structural uh, implications. It has there are there's no uh, need to change any of the actual rules of the society of our institutions, and uh, quite often because they define racism and in this individual way uh, quite often they can say that we are the ones who are the actual racists so I think we've seen that play out again and again and again when um, Andrew Breitbart and other people pick out um, something that Sonia Sotomayor said or that uh, Shirley Sherrod said twist those things and then say, see, there's all those racist people of color, they're the real racists, and it's white people are really okay. Uh, white people are really okay, and uh, in addition, don't bother trying to change any laws or institutional practices or regulations or, uh, you know, don't try to actually create any rules that protect people's rights. So if they get to frame the entire debate and they get to define racism and liberals who have access to those same airwaves are uh, so afraid to talk about it because they, I don't know, they don't know how, they're afraid of being race baited, it makes them nervous, it's emotionally difficult and challenging, uh, then the only real public discourse on race is a conservative discourse. Right. And um, so that's the thing that pisses me off the most, that they get all this airtime and they get to define our issue and our lives and our conditions and nobody says, uh, anything otherwise uh, unless Marie, Teresa, and Tim and Van get to go on TV and do it. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Others? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, to pick up on what Rank is saying, I think it's, we keep saying that we're living in a post-racial era, right? But this is the most volatile <laughs> racial schism that we're finding right now in our, in our country. With, I mean, the perfect example is the whole use of the I word, right? We have the highest, Unfortunately, the highest rates of anti-immigrant, anti-Latino hate crimes are skyrocketing, where at the same time you do have members of Fox News saying, well, we're not the racist, they are. Well, we're not beating people up, right? <laughs> but we're also not shaping the conversation to hold them accountable, and how do we do that? And I think that's w one of the reasons why the work that you do, through is so critical, because we have to start permeating the airwaves and shaping that. Because right now, when you're talking about the issue of race, in America, it's uncomfortable, but it's uncomfortable because people don't even want to admit their own prejudice to their next door neighbor. And it's, we're at a, you know, we're right now in a moment that we either have to choose A or B, but everybody's cowering and choosing B, saying, well, I'm not a racist, so why should I be marching and actually supporting the, the undocumented person? I mean, I, know, I support them, but why should I be supporting them anyway? Because it's not, you know, and then all of a sudden they don't want me either. So it's, it's kind of that, if that makes any, the challenge. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I'm pissed off about all that. Um, and there's one other thing, and I think it's something that uh, many people in this room have spoken to before. I'm angry. I mean, it's, it's one thing to be angry at the right, and, you know, and I am. But I'm also very concerned and troubled. I don't know that pissed off is the, is the terminology I'd use by the way that those of us on the left um, respond to that. And a lot of times what angers me or upsets me is that we seem to have the opinion, many on the left, the liberal left, whatever we take that to mean, I realize it means different things to different people. That, you know, we can either talk about race or we can talk about class. And frankly, most white leftists want to talk about class. We can either talk to the exclusion of race. I'm not saying we don't talk about class, we need to, right? Or we can talk about race or we can talk about gender. Mm -hmm. But we can't do both. Or we can talk about race or we can talk about the ecology, right? Which folks like Van obviously, you know, trying to bridge these issues and make them all interrelated is a struggle because we all sort of have our little fiefdoms on the left 
We all have our little thing that we do, and all that work is vital, but we're not seeing the interconnection. So I think about the way that, you know, the first time that I ever read anything about predatory lending was 1993 or 94. It was a book called Merchants of Misery, and some of you probably read it. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I'd heard anything about this subject. And it was talking about how at that time, this notion of predatory lending by sometimes banks, but usually independent mortgage brokers, pawn shops, et cetera, was really concentrated where? In low-income communities of color. <coughs> and the reality is you couldn't get any traction on this subject from any political figure except for a handful of folks. Maxine Waters was trying to talk about it. She actually wrote the foreword to that book. But at the time, I mean, media didn't want to cover it. Politicians didn't want to cover it. No politician ran on a national platform to deal with predatory lending. Why? Because it was this idea, well, it's not affecting me. It's not my neighborhood. There was an indifference to the suffering of those who were low income, particularly when they were black or brown. So then what happened? The independent mortgage brokers over the next 15 years said, well, hell, if they're not going to regulate us, and we've been making all this money off of these folks, there's more money in the suburbs, there's more money in the exurbs, there's more money in the small towns. So we're gonna go to those places too, and we're gonna jack folks. And here we are 15 years later, and the whole damn economy's melting down, and if we had been paying attention and caring about the connection between racial indifference, which is just another form of white supremacy, and the effect that that would end up having on millions of folks, including millions of white folks now, we might not be in this mess. So it's understanding the interconnections between those things. And if you want to be fighting for good health care, if you want to fight for good jobs, if you want to fight for good educations, if you want to fight for better regulation of the banking industry, that all has to become anti-racist organizing. Because racism is at the root of why we haven't done that stuff yet. And it's important to understand that. Well, um, I think about it somewhat differently in that I think what bothers me the most is when I think about um, the ordinary folks who are hurt, but now they can't holler. It's one thing to be hurt by racism, but to be able to stand up and feel that the world is with you when you denounce it. Uh, it's something else now to be hurt by racism, to be in a community that's disproportionately impacted by all these things, but to actually feel like you have a sock in your mouth that you actually can't name your pain. And I wonder about what that's going to do inside our communities. If we can't actually name our pain, if we can't holler when we're hurt, where does the hurt go? So let's talk a bit about kind of, and just so folks know we're going to provide an analysis of what's wrong and, and move towards a more positive outlook. We're not gonna stay here, I want you to know. But uh, let's talk about kind of where you think progressives, I mean, Tim hit on this a bit, <clears throat> are kind of still missing the mark when it comes to dealing with race. Uh, kind of central issues, strategic uh, thinking, what are we missing and what should we be thinking about in terms of moving the, mo the movement forward? I'm not going first. <laughs> I'm gonna start calling on people now. I am a professor, I'm happy to call on yeah. you. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'll, I'll just keep uh, on the same vein. I, I tend to look at this stuff more internally first. Um, it's easy to get frustrated with what is happening with the, the mainstream media and you know, other communities, but I tend to look more at what we're doing or not doing first. And I, I think that uh, my, you know, I got a chance to spend six months in the White House. Uh, and people now, you know, I, I, I'm in airports and uh, grocery stores, and people come up to me and say, are you, the, are you the green guy? You know, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> yes, actually I am in some strange way. And then they're like, I'm so sorry you were in the White House for six months and then you got kicked out of Obama. And I'm, you know, I have to like counsel other people, you know, I was like, it's, it's all right, it's all right, you, 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 you'll make it, you know. And, you know, uh, but, you know, part of what, you know, for me, I take, take away from it is, first of all, I was in six months, I was in the White House six months longer than anybody else I know. So just, I mean, you gotta, uh, you know, people with my politics don't usually get let in the door. So, and I got a chance to see behind the curtain. And many of you have been in airplanes, maybe going to Colorado or someplace, 
uh, where you have a lot of turbulence and you just hope that somebody in the cockpit knows what they're doing. Uh, I was in a cockpit for six months. Uh, I got a chance to see close up, very clearly, the amount of peril the country is in, the challenges that we're facing. I got a chance to learn that nobody in Washington, D.C. has all the power that they want, including the president, and that there are informal systems of power that operate. And they operate along uh, racial and other lines. Yeah. And we have to be much more sophisticated yeah. now. See, we did everything right. Uh, we had six years of one party authoritarian rule in this country from 2000 to 2006. And the people in this room, we did everything right. Uh, we got 60 votes in the Senate. We got Speaker Pelosi, not some right-wing Democrat, Speaker Pelosi, and Barack Obama elected president. We did everything right. So standing flat-footed, uh, January 2009, uh, everything that we were taught to do, we had done and been successful. And here we are less than 24 months later, and most people uh, feel like the, the hope bubble burst a long time ago because uh, there's other systems of power that we were not taking seriously. And they have to do with the media. They have to do with the, the racial discourse in the media. And that's the next frontier. And so I'm just proud to be here because I feel like what we've got to be able to do now is to marshal our own communication resources, our own ability to tell our own stories, the truth of what's going on in our families and in our homes and in our own hearts, and find more powerful ways to, to, to tell those stories. The good thing is most of us are some, from oral traditions. We, some, if we can't do nothing, nothing else, we can tell some stories. I mean, if that's the issue, that we just need to tell our stories better, I think that's the reason for hope. I think that's the reason for hope. So let's, let's pick up on what Van just said. And if you could, if you did have some power at least to design. Actually, before you go on, you can go I on? answer that Absolutely. question? Okay. Thank you. Anything you want. Go ahead. Aw, thank you, Kathy. That's why you're here. Um, <laughs> and that's because anything she wants, she gets. That's it. So, yeah. Uh -huh. It should be. Um, so I think there is a way in which progressives mi miss the boat on race and um, I want to name it uh, because it's become very clear to us in, in doing our work over the last 10 years for sure. So you know if you think about the conservative approach to racism it's colorblindness. If you think about the alternative, the left liberal alternative, it's diversity. And neither one of those things is actually equity. So I think where progressives get really caught up is that we think diversity is the end goal because you know we're in a multicultural society and everybody should be able to be at the table. And I'm not saying that that is wrong, but it is far, far, far from enough. And under a diversity banner and strategy, what you get is a lot of white organizations reaching out to communities of color to get communities of color to carry out the agenda that the white organizations with all their white yeah. leadership yeah. have developed. And then, you know, and they'll, they'll go to diversity trainings, they'll go to anti-racism trainings, they'll go to undoing racism trainings, and they, but they won't come out. So even if they come out of all that training with a, a sense that, oh, we're all in it together and we need to be inclusive, they don't actually understand what it means to share power, share the kind of power that reshapes an agenda and um, moves forward a strategy that our people can actually participate in with some results back. So that's why we get a lot of last minute, you know, outreach to organizations before elections saying, you know, please um, support, uh, uh, please help us beat back this tax revolt, or please help us win on gay marriage, or uh, please help us on any number of things that, a uh, number of environmental thing, uh, agendas that don't, uh, I'm not saying that communities of color don't have a stake in those, in those uh, buckets of work, but the way that we don't get to actually define how, how we intervene in that work. And 
Um, I do think that if progressives and progressive organizations could make the leap from diversity, a commitment to diversity, to a commitment to equity, and they could understand that diversity is a good first step, but it's insufficient, and that equity is the final goal, then we would have much greater clarity and much more basis for collaboration. Okay, and I think and to piggyback a little bit briefly on that, Rinku, when we start talking about equity, let's not get it twisted. We're talking about funding and leadership development, right? Mm -hmm. So literally right now, with it's the philanthropic space is close to 120 billion plus of money. Organizations led by people of color or serving people of color is less than 5% of that. But when you start looking at where we are going to be as a country, in less than 15 years, 30 year, 15, 20 years, we're gonna be the majority. So we're not actually creating the infrastructure that we need to ensure that we have the leadership and that we actually have the tools and the knowledge to ensure that we are creating an agenda that is reflective of our country. And that's the danger. So when we talk, start talking about equity, everybody's like, oh, well, sure, we'll, we'll send you to a leadership training program. Fantastic. But how are you funding organizations that actually go into the community and actually giving them the tools to ensure that they succeed? Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of us have been in a, uh, you know, been at a place, and we always joke, Voto Latino was never invited to the table. Um, with the exception of myself, everybody else comes from the business world, so we would kind of do things a little, you know, ad hoc, but at the same time very strategic, but reckon with limited resources. But the biggest criticism I found is that it's really a lot of the funders having to see that in order for us to, to really elevate and leverage our capital, it's investing and investing smartly. And I think that's one of the things that we, we don't talk about because we're always, I think, especially as community scholars, we're always afraid to talk about money, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that we have to start empowering ourselves and saying these are realities and this is what we need. Okay. We need money for sure, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you want to say anything before I move on? No, no, go on. You good? You good? I, I, okay. I liked all of that. that was, <laughs> I'm not angry anymore. I'm not, not pissed off anymore. I'm feeling better. I mean, before your answer, you seem pissed off yeah, at me. So I don't I'm know what pissed, pissed off looks like. I'm just trying. I'm, I'm being really just. I'm enjoying. Go. You're just chilling. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I guess the next question is moving forward, and we started to hit on this. If you really could design the conversation about race or around race that would lead to kind of real transformation and thinking and power, what would that look like? What would some of those, what would the framework look like? The things that we would have to hit, clearly Rinku hit on the idea of equity, but what do we mean by equity beyond kind of more money? Well, I would say, um, to chime in on that, that there, everything everyone has said is part of that. And, and the, the other piece that I think is so critical, and it goes to something Rinku just said, you know, the, the, the conservative, way of talking about race is colorblindness and ours is diversity. But you know, there's also a liberal left version of colorblindness that's mm -hmm. equally problematic. And it is that tendency to say, we're gonna downplay race, we're gonna talk about this instead, because it's, you know, white folks can't deal with the truth, so we can't talk about the truth, because they're gonna backlash. Well, you know, my folks have been front lashing for 400 years, and I think this idea <laughs> that we have to hold people's hands and we can't challenge people, I realize it's difficult, and I realize some of us have an easier time being able to do it than others, but we have to do it. I mean, this color blindness or color muteness, which is the inability to talk about race, right, means that we end up framing every issue. I mean, take healthcare, for instance. Um, it's one thing to talk about the need for universal health care. I don't know anyone on the left who doesn't support that. Uh, most of us support something far more dramatic than, of course, what we've gotten. But here's the point. It's one thing to talk about that. It's quite another to address racial disparities in health care, which, according to the research, are not fundamentally about money. They are not fundamentally about whether you have coverage or not. That's the great myth that somehow if we just close economic gaps of coverage, the racial gap will close. The research says that's wrong. So our conversation both around race and around an issue like healthcare or education has to be about how rising tides in fact don't lift all boats, that that is mythological. It's never been true in history. It doesn't happen. And with regard to health, the two biggest things that affect folk of color's health, it's not just not having coverage, it is number one, disparate treatment by physicians who view their patients of color through a stereotypical lens, regardless of how progressive they may profess to be and outwardly be. And then secondly, the cumulative effect of racism on the black and brown body, the physiological impact 
of microaggressions and discrimination, which has been studied for 15 years, and yet in all of the conversation around healthcare, and I, I don't blame you know any politician for this per se, the media doesn't look at any of it. We have 15 years of research, at least, mm -hmm. on the bioaccumulative impact of discrimination. The fact that African American women with college degrees have higher rates of infant mortality for their children than white women who dropped out of school after eighth grade. That isn't about class. That isn't about coverage. That isn't about occupational status. That is about something else. That is about race specific injury. And so we have got to insist that in these conversations we're having about the need for universal programs of uplift, which again, I don't know anyone on the left who doesn't support that, we also have to insist that the race specific injury that continues to exist be part of that conversation. So I would just want to make sure that we're again connecting the dots between the class and the race issues and not assuming that one is the other because they're not. They're, they're oftentimes, they're connected but they're different. Mm -hmm. Great. You were talking about the social security piece, the age of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for me the conversation um, I think in the conversation we have to acknowledge a few things. So one is that racism operates on multiple levels. So it does operate in our uh, individual selves, in our brains, and our biases and prejudices. It does operate interpersonally when we're dealing with other people. It operates institutionally in the sort of rules and regulations, uh, both written and unwritten. Uh, we call the unwritten rules practices. And, and it operates uh, in, a, in a structural way that involves history and the larger culture and that creates a container for these other, these other levels. And I think that quite often um, people think either that all of the work is individual, if I just change my own mind, if I just change the mind of my racist uncle or you know my bigoted teacher or you know some individual person if I can just change their mind then things will get better uh, and the the problem with that is that that's an endless piece of work so we all have to do that but it is ongoing it takes your whole life and um, and uh, quite often when I'm in discussions with people they they will say well we have to work on ourselves first before we can interact with anyone else or before we can address some institutional issue or before we can think structurally and we can't be chronological like that if we if we right. go chronologically then we never get to the uh, other levels the, the the bigger levels and I think um, one way that I've uh, manage to get some traction in these conversations is to help people recognize how the rules of society have shaped their own lives. That's a really challenging thing to do, but I think our storytelling has, has to be in part about that. And once people can recognize those rules and how they shape our actual lives, then, then the discussion is about, so how can we work on those rules while we work on ourselves? And uh, while, by working on the institutional projects, the change projects, that in fact actually gives us a focused, optimistic, measurable uh, intervention to make into the racial dynamic and into, into racism that uh, over time will actually make us feel that we're getting somewhere or not if we're not uh, but it's a reality check that gets you out of your own head all of this can't be done in our own heads that's uh, that's a really I mean we're all smart people and everything but that's you know your brain is only this big so uh, whereas the world is this big and I think connecting people's uh, individual selves to that larger worldwide project, the institutional project, the structural project, um, that can activate a lot of people. I want to, yeah, I agree. I want to uh, pick up uh, this topic of uh, missed opportunities in this past period. Uh, I have a particular view, which is, we can talk a lot about the rise of the politics of hatred, um, but I think you actually, if you do the math, what happened between 2008 and 2010 
was about 20% the rise of the politics of hatred and 80% the collapse of the politics of hope. That it was actually the people who we worry about and wring our hands about and think are so big and strong and terrible, their, their numbers for most of, of 2009 and 2010 went from about 17% to 19%. I mean like hardcore, angry, uh, bitter uh, opponents of our agenda went from about 17% to 19%. Uh, we call them the Tea Party now. They used to have another name. We used to call them cranks, right? Just cranks, grumpy people. Um, <laughs> then they got better marketing and now we're scared of them. It doesn't actually... They got organized. Yeah, you know, they got a little bit better organized and got better marketing. But they're basically just the same cranky, <laughs> grumpy people we've always had. Um, but then, then they actually did start growing after we didn't respond for months and months and months. But the collapse of the politics of hope is actually, the, the, I think, the main story. And to Tim's point, there's some missed opportunities. You pointed out missed opportunities to really galvanize more energy around healthcare by focusing on some of the problems that are more personally felt by people and perhaps getting more people engaged. I just want to hit a couple other ones. Because the movement that we're a part of right now has a bigger challenge than we know this movement is going to have to govern. I'll say that again. The movement we're a part of right now is going to have to govern. We often prepare to protest, prepare to critique. We don't prepare to govern. And we've got to now, because you see what happens when we slack off on the governing side, the other side does their backlash, front lash, side lash, and any other kind of lash they can get their hands on. And we can have all the support that we want to in the government and still lose the country. So what I want to suggest is that looking back at what we did not do, not what the bad guys did, but what we did not do in the past two years is probably going to be as helpful for racial justice struggle as anything else. Uh, on the financial fight, the Wall Street regu regulatory fight, we were essentially missing in action. Racial justice voices disappeared. There were people who wanted to push but they didn't figure out how to push loud enough and we wound up with a Wall Street reform bill that is all about the next crisis. It's all about putting some speed bumps in the road for the next crisis and nothing about giving relief to people who are still suffering in this crisis. Now, if we had grabbed the, the, the financial services reform stuff and said that's a racial justice issue and struggle, it's conceivable that we could have actually broadened out the front um, beyond the Elizabeth Warrens and the George Sources of the world and had a much bigger uh, uh, impact and gotten more relief for people in terms of foreclosure, credit card bills and stuff today. We didn't do it, we gotta figure out why we didn't do it. Um, the other, the other, another piece is, when the stuff got bad, in August of 2009, I, I know a little bit about this particular period. I, I know you do. <laughs> when stuff got really, really bad, uh, look at the numbers of people who were protesting and disrupting the town hall meetings on the other side. Minuscule, minuscule. Classic asymmetric strategy. They would send three or four people to scream in a meeting of 200 people. Uh, and dominate the news cycle. Uh, classic asymmetrical stuff. And we fail to respond. I suspect at that time, that fall, racial justice forces could have led millions of white people, millions of white people, uh, to protest publicly about the kind of racist, uh, divisive things that we were seeing. There was nothing in the world to prevent us except we just didn't know we needed to do it from having millions of people of color and white people standing in front of Starbucks, in front of uh, Safeway, not to give corporate media, but you know, certain stores, uh, <laughs> sorry about that, certain stores, uh, 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 farmer's markets. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, churches, mosques, synagogues, you know, community places. Uh, you know, with signs, with banners saying we are one you know, saying, yes, we can. Uh, and, and we could have conceivably crushed this thing in its uh, initial stages by just saying, we're not doing that anymore. We did that, we're not doing it anymore. It could have been, you know, literally three days of mobilization. For some reason, we didn't know how. Didn't know we had to. What I want to suggest is that we, we're going to get through this tough period and we're going to be here again, trying to govern again with a progressive agenda. And next time, I want us to be very, very clear that 
it's not just about trying to win on election day. Uh, this struggle has to be about trying to win every single day and every time we're challenged standing up. I actually want to pick up on maybe something Van said and maybe go off script a little and just see if you comment a bit more, maybe all of you, about the tension that often uh, seems evident between what we perceive to be as kind of racial justice movement politics and then electoral politics, yes. right? There's this disdain if you want to be involved in governing or electoral politics, you're not really progressive or left or something like that. And how at this moment do we deal with that tension and kind of build on in a, a positive way 2008 and the lessons learned from 2008. Well, I'll, I'll just, just jump in on that, that one just and to kind of follow up with what Rinku was saying. She was giving a, a kind of a framework to think about racism you know, being both internal and structural. And I think that change uh, maps that in some ways and that change has to be top down, bottom up, and inside out. Uh, it's got to be top down in terms, you know, we can't just leave uh, the federal government in the hands of our enemies and expect to make a lot of progress. Um, so even if we can't get everything done that we want to get done out of D.C., we, we, we certainly can't let other people have the, the levers of control in D.C. But also, you can see right now, D.C. can't do much by itself. You have to have that bottom-up movement, and that's what's been missing, is that bottom-up sense of movement to get the best out of D.C. And what's, cops, what's stopping that is the inside-out piece. You know, we talk about power more than anybody. I know people on every kind of political, economic, we talk about power all the time and are more afraid of power than anybody I know. Uh, we talk about power. It's empowerment this, empowerment that. We want power. We don't want no power. I'm, you don't. I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, because when you have power, you become a real target. And there's a sense that we're not healed from some, tra some, some historical traumas. We've been trained not to have power. We've been trained to protest. We've been trained to, to critique and to be mad at Massa. We have not been trained to grab the whip and put it down and run the plantation. That's not what we've been trained to do. And so uh, I, w I would argue that it's the inside out transformation that will ignite the bottom-up transformation that will make the top-down transformation work. And what that means is that the politics of hope and change, which is the movement that you know, we could say we're a part of, uh, for this next period is going to have to be a lot about restoring the hope. Uh, that's going to be a lot about that. That we spent the past two years trying to ram uh, our head against the wall trying to make change. And we wound up, you know, to your point, dealing with a lot of subcommittees and the subcommittee, the subcommittee and the public option and all kind of stuff that was not that inspiring. Uh, and trying to get to the change, we lost the hope. And so I think that uh, we've got to now look at our politics again, uh, inside out, bottom up, and then top down. No, and I think, I mean, just, and I think to piggyback on that, I think one of our biggest problems as progressives, we're, all, we're very much into all this technology and we want the next new shiny thing, but we have to also understand that it took us a long, long time to get where we are today, right? I mean, our country is literally feeling a devastation that it took 30 years to build. So just the, by the fact that we elected someone and we have the power in Congress and the Senate doesn't mean that they don't need the help from the bottom up to make sure that we have a continuous and we actually allow for some policies to settle before we get disgruntled. So I think we have to have that conversation. And additionally, I think we also have to start talk, having a conversation of for too long we allow our politics to be siloed. Very similar to what you were saying earlier, Tim. So perfect example right now is immigration, right? Immigration, your knee-jerk reaction is like, oh, that's a Latino issue. It's not a Latino issue. It's an American issue because our, uh, our American identity has been built, for the most part, on immigrants, regardless if they came 200 years ago or they came yesterday. And I think that's where we have to start having these conversations and we have to stop being silent and saying, no, these are issues that relate to all of us. And we have to bring progressive whites into the movement because right now I think they actually feel battered as well. And they've been one of our largest, biggest allies for the most part. So how do we actually extend that and say, this is community building? One of the areas that we're working on right now with Photo Latino is, it's called the United We Win campaign. And it's based out of a World War II poster. It was the very first ad campaign that the military did where they showed black and white soldiers working together 
in World War II. That's what we need right now. This is a united front. They, the Tea Party is 19% is of the Republican Party. That's not even the majority of the Republican Party. So why are we allowing them to actually shape this conversation when the majority of us want to be asked to participate, but we're basically asking only the folks that are brown or maybe gay to actually join our ranks. And we have to actually look wider than that. Because at the end of the day, no, I'm being honest. At the end of the day, it's really strength in numbers. And how do we actually have those conversations? So for example, we're launching on Monday with USSA, United States Students Association, Generational Alliance, and the Dream Activists, we're launching Vote For Me. Vote For Me is the concept of, you have 800,000 Dream Act kids who have been starving themselves, they've been marching, they've been protesting, but they haven't been able to break into it as a problem that is an American issue. So the concept, find someone that you can go ahead and register that will represent you at the polls. Because you're right, we can organize, we can boycott. I always joke that they'll always give us permits. <coughs> but the least thing that they expect is for us to organize smartly and to organize to the polls, just like we did in 2008. And we have to continue the fight. But the longer that we basically get shy about it, that's where the problem starts. Are you weighing in on this? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> So something Van said reminded me of it. I think there are two things, and it goes back to this part of the question that had to do with the tension between electoral and, and activist politics. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I can see interesting points on both sides of this, of this debate. Number one, uh, what Van was saying about the way that those of us on the left sometimes run from success or governing, it's almost as if we have this idea that obscurity is the mark of legitimacy, <laughs> right? So that, so that if no one knows what we're doing, that's because we are really down. And the minute, and, the, and I had to deal with, I mean, I had to have arguments folks on the left about Van when, when it was like, well, yeah, he used to be about something um, back when he was doing all that stuff that Glenn Beck said he was doing, some of which he wasn't even doing, but, but that was when he was real. And now he's getting invited to the White House as a best-selling book. He can't possibly be about anything now because the system is so jacked up that for him to get attention in a jacked up system means that he's jacked up. I mean, that is some crazy, like internalized, I don't know what kind of oppression, but that is some internalized <laughs> political oppression. The idea that the less, the less quoted you are, the less connected, you, the, the less people you know, the more revolutionary you really are, which is a recipe for permanent disempowerment, number one. Now, the other piece of that, let's not get too caught up in this idea, however, that because we have connections to people in positions of governance, that that somehow is the work. You know, when Ella Baker called that first meeting at Shaw that launched the founding of SNCC, which let's recall this is 50 year anniversary this year, and it's important that we as a nation talk about that because the media has not. She knew who the president was at that time. At that moment it was still Eisenhower, but it wasn't going to be for long. And after Kennedy won the election, we forget Kennedy and Johnson were the two primary targets of the civil rights struggle. It was not right-wingers. It was these nominal, I mean, really nominal liberal to you know, centrist type folks. That was who they were arguing against at the March on Washington. They weren't talking about Bull Connor at the March. That wasn't there. That wasn't who they weren't talking about, you know, uh, uh, Jim Folsom. I mean, they were talking about President Kennedy, John Lewis, they were prepared to go and humiliate that man if he didn't get with the program. You have to be prepared to challenge your friends, quote unquote, every bit as much as you challenge your adversaries. When Dr. King wrote the letter from the Birmingham jail and he talked about the, the white moderate, understand those folks today would be called liberals. They were moderates then. That shows how far we've fallen in some regards. Those folks now would be liberals. He was saying y'all are the problem. Not, it's, it's easy to look at, at, at George Wallace. It's easy to look at Bull Connor. It's a lot harder to say, no, actually, we're gonna be on your doorstep. And if you will recall, uh, this president said, when he was on the campaign trail, and I don't know if we heard it or if we just didn't pay attention, he said, you are going to have to force me. You are going to have to make me do, and it's almost like we thought, no, because he, we get invited to the parties and stuff. <laughs> and like, and like, I get a call, and I get an email from the president every day, <laughs> or from Daniel Axelrod. It's a, it's just, you know, we think, we get all excited. I got a 4th of July message from President Obama. Yeah, you and 200 million other people. What does that have to do with anything? Like at some point, you still have to hold folks accountable, and they've asked you to do it. So just do it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just, just to tag on, onto that, and it, it's a, it was a remarkable experience for me. Uh, 
I remember the inauguration. And we had two million people there, something, you know, it's crazy. It's like, you know, it's like the Million Man March plus oh, a couple more million white people. It's just this unbelievable. <laughs> I was like, man, this is going to be easy, you know. Uh, and, you know, the only, uh, the only sounds you could hear were, you know, our teeth chattering out there and the Republicans' knees knocking because they were that terrified by this huge show of force. And then the next day came. And it was like a ghost town. And it stayed a ghost town. You had people coming up to like, like you said, go to the parties and stuff. But we didn't see anybody in the streets again until the orcs came over the mountain. <laughs> and I'm like, who is these people? And where is that people? And People were like watching it on TV, like, you know, munching popcorn, like it was a movie, like, ooh, I wonder what's gonna happen. <laughs> Obama better duck. <laughs> and this was not a movie, this was happening in our country. And there was, and I, my, I just feel like somehow, yes, we can became yes, he can. And then it became, well, maybe he can't. And then it became, all this grump, maybe you don't want to, and then maybe, and I was like, if, if, if we would be much better off if we would just go back to the original slogan. It's not yes, he can, it's yes, we can. Yeah. So, um, I think, I, I think there's a false division between racial justice organizing and electoral work, but, uh, as false as the division is, there are some cautions, I guess, that I would have. So I think the first thing is, I do believe that people of color who are progressive should run for office and should win. They should get supported by the organizational infrastructure wherever they're running. Um, but I think one thing that tends to happen is because of the way elections work, because they're so expensive, it's so expensive to run for office, you know, it's something like the average congressional uh, run costs two million dollars something like that it's that's a lot of money for a community of color to produce to move somebody into office so I think one thing that happens is that elections are so crunched time-wise and they're so expensive and they require so much human energy that we um, when we work on them we essentially blow our wads for uh, and then we're dead right after the election happens win or lose so even if we have even if we win and our person gets in there we're not actually prepared to be there the next day because frankly everybody's exhausted you know people have gotten divorced in that time, they've run out of money, their bank accounts are empty, um, there's just not enough energy left. So I think uh, when we're considering electoral opportunities, we have to be careful. We have to have a set of criteria that helps us to determine which of those fights are really worth investing in and which are not. And we have to be able to save enough of our energy and resources to do exactly the work that needs to happen post-election, regardless of who wins and I think so that's one thing you know exercise caution be be bold but exercise caution if you can do that and save some of your energy for what needs to happen after the second thing is that when we do elect people we love and people that we've worked with and people we trust we um, it's not just that we want to um, that we think now they can do it by themselves, yes he can, it's also that there's this kind of um, emotional cultural thing that happens where it seems impolite then to pressure that person whom we love, um, who we've worked with often for many years, who we trust, uh, it seems rude to be like knocking on that person's door and protesting and you know saying now we need you to really carry out our agenda and uh, we're going to make you do it. So even though politicians tell us, make me do it, I think if we know those politicians, we actually yep. feel strange about making them do it, and then we don't. So you have to save some of your energy to do that work post-election, and we have to deal with whatever happens inside us emotionally that prevents us from um, being able to continue engaging with 
sometimes confronting uh, our friends who make it into those positions. But I think, to piggyback, I think it's absolutely right, but I think we also have to be comfortable with our elected friends, right? Because every, every single time someone, every single time a lobbyist writes a check, that's a transaction. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So they're banking on a transaction. So every time someone, someone goes and volunteers, that is a transaction and we are banking. And our error is not trying to withdraw from that bank. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between the person that's actually writing the big dollars because the lobbyists understand, as does the politician who is receiving that check, mm -hmm. understands that they are banking futures. So we have to figure that out as well mm -hmm. and not be afraid of that. So I, I want to kind of build on Rinku's last point about being able to kind of pressure the people that we love and that. So for all the kind of LGBT folks uh, in the room, raise your hands if you feel, there you go. Uh, how do we pressure the racial justice movement to make LGBT issues, for example, central to the work that we do moving forward? How do we bring, people have talked about kind of an intersectional approach. Tim talked about kind of, it's not race or class, it's race and class. How do we broaden our analysis at the same time that we popularize this in a way that moves the masses, not just the folks who are already connected to our movements? Well, <laughs> uh, we just did this study that um, we did workshops on here and that there might be copies floating around on uh, where we surveyed racial justice organizations about how they deal with LGBT constituencies and issues. And um, I think the first thing that really struck me about that study is that um, there are many, 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 many millions of LGBT people of color in our communities. So there isn't, there isn't, it's not like either you can be a person of color or you can be a white gay person. That's just ridiculous. Um, and if you're, an, if you're a racial justice organization and you claim to, to um, support a constituency, a community of people of color, there are gay people and trans people and lesbians in that community. So uh, I think the first, I think there is a standard we have to set for racial justice organizations that says we have to represent everybody uh, who is in our communities and that includes queer people um, as well as straight people. And secondly, I think that, um, you know, there are groups that say, uh, well, we're Asian and we work on Asian issues, so we don't work on gay issues. And, or, um, you know, we're an economic justice organization and we don't work on gay issues. <coughs> well, gay issues um, are Asian issues and they're economic justice issues and they're criminal justice issues. Um, don't ask, don't tell. The people who are most affected by that are black women, black women in the military. So don't ask, don't tell. Uh, whatever you think about the US military, and I know there's a range of opinion in the room, um, nevertheless, employment by the US military is a key economic uh, engine for people of color and we have to be yeah. we have to be able to protect their rights in that in that in that employment situation so in almost every issue that a racial justice organization works on whether it's police brutality or workplace discrimination or housing i can guarantee that if you really studied it you would find that lgbt people of color are among the most vulnerable people uh, affected by that kind of discrimination and it is it is the job of racial justice organizations to take care of our people and we are our yeah. people and if, if I could add to that yeah I think the other key is you know so oftentimes we don't see the way that what are obviously race issues maybe obviously class and obviously gender are also about sexuality. So I'll give you the example, sort of classic example that I learned from really sort of too late. When I was uh, in the mid 90s, I was doing community organizing and part of the work then, 95, 96, was around trying to block this really punitive, harsh welfare reform law, which of course became law and which we're now starting to see some of the really horrible nature of in terms of what it's left us with in this gutted safety net. Well, couple things. Number one, most of us in the room probably recognized immediately why that legislation was classist. It was aimed at, at, at poor folks. 
why it was racist, all the rhetoric, all the imagery, the campaign was around really black and brown folk who were poor. And it was sexist because it was so often aimed in this very patriarchal way at demonizing women as the incubators of social decay in those communities. Those three were obvious. Now, what wasn't as obvious to us, but I think would have been important from a coalition building perspective around LGBT, issue, LGBT issues, is that that same legislation was horribly heterosexist and straight supremacist mm -hmm. because what was the only conservative answer for these women who were single women? Find yourself a man, mm. right? Now, first of all, you know, it, it ain't like that's necessarily the easiest thing even if you're looking for a man. <laughs> it's, not like, it's not like these women said, oh damn, I forgot. You know, there are some women who would, you know, you can't just go, oh, I, now I've got a man. But more importantly, if you're a lesbian, that is not really all that alluring to you. <laughs> so the fact that that's the only solution you're being offered is straight supremacist. It's saying you must live in this heteronormative way for us to actually provide you any assistance. So had we been talking about that, I mean, imagine, I don't know if it would have made a difference, but imagine if we had gone and said, hey, this isn't just about race and class and gender. This is also about sexuality and the kind of connections we could have been making with racial justice orgs, economic justice orgs, gender justice orgs, and LGBT liberation orgs 15 years ago, and we didn't do it. We all missed the boat on that, but it's never too late to begin to make those connections. And I think that would be an important way to also move through the, the seeming divide on issues that are very much related. Mm -hmm. And we want to be clear that there were organizations and there were leaders actually making the Trying point. to do that, but it wasn't they just, enough. They just it weren't wasn't enough. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I have some questions um, from folks in the room uh, that you guys can, can take up. The first um, is, what's want. wrong with the term illegal if a person has broken the law or violated legal ordinances? Is undocumented the same problem? Mm -hmm. We're just going to take these questions and, and somebody wants to answer them? Answer one? Well, people are not illegal. I mean, to, to, to say that somebody is, is an illegal as a noun is to make them a non-person, a non-human being. You might be a person who uh, did something wrong. That doesn't mean you are a crime. Uh, hey, look, there's a crime. Hello there, Mr. Crime. Uh, you know, it, it, I don't know if you remember back in the 80s, people used to call homeless people, just call them homeless. There's a homeless. Um, no, it's a person that doesn't have a house. It's a person. Uh, and I think that part of the challenge that we've got is uh, we recognize very clearly uh, when somebody is trying to dehumanize us. You feel that dart comes over and it hits you right in the heart. Uh, and then you try to tell your, you know, white coworker, and they look at you like you are on some strange drug. <laughs> That experience, as black folks, should give us a great deal of empathy. There are sometimes there will be a word or an experience or something that is so charged for us we can't even speak about it. Somebody else didn't even see it as an insult. Uh, when, we, when, when, when we're naming sports teams after Native Americans and call it, the, oh, hey, here are the Redskins. Uh, you know, we, don't, we wouldn't want to see a sports team called the Coonskins with, you know, some, you know, big black, like, but that's, we accept in the black community all kinds of abuse and dehumanization of other communities. And we have to get educated. And I think that part of the opportunity here is to say, uh, how, however we want to work through these tough problems, the language that we use should not be so charged as to shut down rational discourse. Once you call somebody an illegal, uh, the, 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 their humanity, their children, uh, the service they're giving to the country, what they are, the, the fact that you are sitting there eating a meal that you wouldn't even have if they weren't here, disappears. Reality disappears uh, because it is, uh, it, is, it is that kind of a term. And we have to eliminate these terms. And one thing I think that we have to understand is we thought, some of us thought, some of us you know, foolish people thought that this was primarily a political and economic battle over what kind of country we're going to be, and it is that. But it's also a battle at the level of ideas and values and language and, 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 and who we're going to be even in having the conversation. And we cannot have an intelligent conversation uh, with each other, about each other, calling each other those kind of names. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a matter of, you know, how do you actually create a climate for discourse? But 
this is the this is the issue. The moment you say illegal anything, you immediately think criminal. Whether it's you know whether they it's they've been incarcerated because they raped, they murdered, or what have you. And what we need to do is find our humanity to recognize that in the majority of undocumented individuals are economic refugees. They have come from countries that have an informal sector where they've had to fend for themselves, and they've come here simply to figure out how to feed their family. But I also challenge you to think of them, not just the undocumented, but immigrants in general, as fundamental entrepreneurs. The fundamental fabric of what makes America amazing. Because we're not getting the old, we're not getting their tired, we're not getting their sick. We're, no, it's true. We're getting the, their healthiest, and for the most part, their males who are ready to work and put money on the food on their table and making sure that people are strong. And that is the fundamental difference when you start talking and starting to group everybody as illegal. You're all of a sudden looking at an individual person. You're no longer looking at them as an individual person, as someone that you can actually relate to, as also an entrepreneur who also has hunger in their belly, but someone immediately, you're not giving them the opportunity to actually do honest work, but you're immediately grouping them with rapists, murderers, and the head snot. So that's the danger. I think also, um uh, I well said, both of you. Um, it is about the framework of illegality and immigration. So the the words are bad. The noun is really not to be used. That's that's just a no brainer. But illegal alien, illegal immigrant, even um, uh, generates these sort of criminal. Um, images and that and that is why they're used that's why conservatives use them uh, we have a memo that frank luntz who's a right-wing communication strategist wrote to the anti-immigrant groups and he said you know we have to use that language illegal immigrant illegal alien uh, because we need to play to americans attachment to law and order um, I mean, any of you who have been missing the rule of law in your communities where the police are like killing people with impunity know yeah. how hypocritical uh, that attachment to law and order can be. But, but that, is, that is why conservatives use that framework because that's what they're trying to evoke in Americans to, because they can't really come out and say, um, we don't like brown skinned people. We don't want more of them coming here. We don't want people to be speaking Chinese and Spanish and Bengali and um, Korean in, in our neighborhoods. We want it all to be English. We want people to be white because that's what we're comfortable with. That is the actual, that's what's at the root of that restriction movement but they can't say it because uh, lucky for us Americans find it offensive to be openly racist that's that's a good thing for us we should take advantage of that but the the reason that illegal the illegal framework is a problem is because it erases all of the ways in which our actual policies make it impossible for certain people to be legal that is our actual immigration policy makes it very very difficult for Mexicans without a ton of money to come to the country with a proper set of papers and that is because uh, agribusiness needs those Mexicans to be undocumented so that they can be uh, they can provide the cheapest labor possible and so when we so um, so the whole framework is dehumanizing and it has to be that way in order for the system to run in the ways that keeps America's economy growing without taxing America's cultural uh, tolerance and uh, there are people who have recognized this in the past. Do you know uh, Jimmy Carter actually banned the use of the terms illegal immigrant and illegal alien from use in the federal government when he was president? That was in 1976 to 1980. Oh, yes, those were the years. <laughs> those were the Carter years. Um, and uh, so 
obviously it's not just that you know government put the term illegal alien into a bunch of laws and that's the official that's the official language and so everybody has to use it the president of this country at one point understood that that official language no longer was appropriate for the kind of country we needed to be moving into the future that got undone over the last 20 30 years by a very concerted conservative effort to um, cast really uh, most immigrants with the suspicion of illegality because how can you tell that is what Arizona's SB 1070 is about the suspicion of illegality that allows police to stop whoever they want to stop um, and uh, that's really going to be on the basis of skin color and accent so what the, what's a problem with uh, the legal framework is that it is applied in a racist way. It comes out of a racist set of laws, and uh, we can't keep, we're not really going to make serious progress in immigration unless we can deal with the history and the rules and regulations that put people into a particular status or not. No, and I think, I mean, just to, just to, <laughs> that was incredibly well said. And just two things. I think every single time we start talking about immigration reform, let's just think about the very first piece of legislation that talked about the type of immigrants we wanted in this country were for the Chinese back in the 1930s. That was the first piece. It wasn't, it wasn't the Irish, it wasn't the Polish, it wasn't the Germans, it was, it was the Chinese, right? And so that was the first piece of legislation, number one. But I think the biggest problem right now that we're, that's happening because of the Arizona le legislation, and it's happening while we're sleeping, because 22 other states have introduced the same legislation, mm -hmm. is that we're inadvertently creating two types of Americans. And we're condoning it. We're saying, you know, it's, this is really about immigration. It's not about immigration. Right. Because immigration, yes, we need to secure our borders. Yes, we need to have smart policy. But at the end of the day, it's about two Americans. And with that comes all these discussions of race, socioeconomic justice. But we're afraid to start talking about it. But the moment that you have legislation that says, you know what, I think my neighbor might be undocumented. I'm going to call the police. But if the police doesn't show up, I'm going to sue the police department. There's a problem. And that's what's happening in Arizona. And I think it's, and I have to share with you that one of my biggest disappointments so far was with the administration was when they were not forceful of what happened with immigration. So when they had the, the whole conversation on race, the beer summit, that was important. But all of a sudden you're starting to create a different, I'm being facetious. <laughs> I'm being facetious. But all of a sudden you have 46 million Americans that by the color of their skin are being called out and questioned their Americanness. And there wasn't a loud, not outcry, not only from the administration, but from the progressive movement. I have to tell you that was painful as an American Latino. Mm -hmm. okay, so uh, there, we're running out of time, unfortunately, because this is so great. So maybe we can just have one or two people answer some of these questions. Uh, almost as a follow-up, someone says, what should radical justice advocates actually do, do, about changing the administration's policy so that immigrants, all of them, are treated and live as human beings? What one, two, three things can organizations do? Or should they do? More, I mean, more conversations, right? I mean, I think it's, and having, and not being afraid. Uh, I mean, I think it's, whoever asked that question, what is wrong with illegal, thank you. Because most people are too afraid to ask that question. And I think that there's so much, so I've been doing, I've been working with Voto Latino now for six years. The amount of people that are shocked that 80 per, that 60 percent of all Latinos are U.S. born is shocking. 60 percent of us, right? That 80 percent of them speak primarily and consume in English is also shocking, mm -hmm. because they didn't. Again, we didn't show up just yesterday. There's some that you know. Uh, some a friend of mine, she lives in Texas. She's like, I never moved. The border moved me, right? But it's true. So how do we actually start having this conversation where it's black, white, brown, Asian, and having a conversation on where we stand. Um, on Not to plug anything, but I hope you guys tune in. <laughs> on October 18th, Voto Latino and MSNBC, is, they're going to have the very first talk on Latinos and politics and immigration. It's the very first time that a cable news show does something on politics, bringing in brown faces on national TV. It's 2010, guys, mm -hmm. right? So the more we have these conversations, the more we actually hold our media accountable to having these conversations, this dialogue, 
is, I think, is critical. And it takes, and it takes a village, as Hillary Clinton says, uh, to educate and to have those conversations. And not to be afraid to ask, what is, what's wrong with illegal? And what is, you know, what's your experience? If, if I can mm -hmm. jump in on that, too. We also have to connect what's happening right now to what has happened before. A lot of times, the reason that the other side is able to frame the immigration issue in the way that they do is because they're able to succeed in convincing us that we are at this unique moment where we just have to crack down because you know because now things are out of control but now here's the thing how many of you in this room and I, and I ask this because you know I did not know of this until you know fairly recently a lot of progressive folks who I know who do anti-racism work did not how many people were aware that there were 600,000 Mexican Americans run out of this country pushed back over the border in the 1930s at a time when the fear was that they were taking jobs away from white labor see very many of you are not raising your hands some are but the fact is, we don't talk about that. 600, there were over a million overall, but 600,000 of them were citizens of this country and they were run out in the 1930s. So we have been down this road before. And I think if we explain that and we talk about that and we frame this issue as this sort of continual resurgence of nativist stuff that comes around all the time, that it isn't new, that all the same excuses and arguments we're using now were used 70 years ago and for the very same reason, then we can get at the bottom of this in a much more more effective way but if we don't know that history and if we're not engaging that discussion and talking about that then folks think you know we're in this unique moment and there's nothing new about this this is not the new racism this is the old racism you know it's the same stuff I just, um, I just want to just kind of pull it back and try to get the whole conversation under the same tent um, because it actually fits one of the reasons why I push racial justice groups, social justice groups to think about governing isn't because I want people to run for office. I'm not going to run for office. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's be, governing isn't just about the people who run, just to be clear. Uh, it's about uh, trying to, to uh, govern from below, as they talk about in South Africa, it's just as important as governing from above. But governing, that mindset that you're taking responsibility, is so important because we are about to inherit a nightmare scenario. The nightmare scenario is this. The country continues to get more racially diverse, but less economically prosperous. That's not a recipe for a common ground. That's a recipe for a battleground. A country getting more racially diverse, but less economically prosperous. Your opponents understand this very well. What they want to do, therefore, is to focus on the diversity and try to shrink the diversity. That's their response. That's why they attack Muslims. That's why they attack immigrants. That's why they attack people of color. It's all about trying to shrink the diversity as a response to the crisis. We've got to fight back on that and at the same time say, no, no, no. The diversity is our strength, to your point. Uh, we have the genius of all peoples here in America. Uh, we have every color, every faith, every, every kind of human that walks the earth is here in America. That's our strength. That's how we're going to solve our problems. We don't want to shrink the, the, the diversity. We want to grow the economy. We want to actually expand the ability of people to have more work, more wealth, and better health here. And we've got ideas about that. And we've got to be able to do both, pivot from a staunch opposition to racist demagoguery and pivot to a powerful progressive economic populism that brings us together. The formula is put America back to work and pull America back together. That's the framework that we can use to push forward. There's a march that's going to happen um, October the 2nd uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., the One Nation Working Together March that has that as a slogan. Put America back to work, pull America back together. If we don't, to Tim's point, combine a staunch anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-bigotry, anti-bias politics with a powerful uh, uh, economic populism that can speak to the broad needs of working people, then we are going to get shredded. Mm -hmm. And solidarity now, solidarity is got to be the watchword. They are going to try to pick us off one by one by one. And it's the oldest story in politics. You divide and conquer. And I am so happy to be a part of this uh, forum because we have the opportunity to finally grow up as a movement and say, no, thank you. You don't get to run our government. You don't get to run our communities. You don't get to run your mouths uncontested. We're not putting up with it anymore. We are going to be one country, and we're going to be a prosperous country, and we're going to be an example to the world.
All right, I've been I've been uh, instructed to lighten this up a bit. Um, <laughs> Good. So, uh, oh yeah, I like that where it was. But okay, so you get to pick from one of these three questions. Which here's number one: uh, Who do you get inspiration from? Or what's your favorite book? Or what keeps you going in this work? Take one of those three. Okay. Inspiration. You're going to take inspiration. Or, no, wait. Oh, okay. I'm getting the choices yeah, straight. Okay. Uh, favorite book or. Inspiration, favorite book, or what keeps you going? Okay. Hmm. Oh, I thought Rinku was about to go. Uh, I, was yeah. All right. I was going to listen. Um, okay, what keeps me going? I'll do what keeps me going, and maybe later I'll do my favorite book because <laughs> I have many. Um, Although if you get on, if you friend me on Facebook, you can see my favorite book, so let's yeah, just yeah. do that. Um, you know, uh, what keeps me going, I think, is I really try to enjoy my life. Um, I have many wonderful friends. I love my family. Um, I don't have any kids, so I have to borrow other people's, but they... They're helpful. The kids, the kids are good, um, and really, when I am really in a state and I just I I'm done, um, I often am lucky enough to have a kid near me to be with, um, and there's something about. Um, Kids are just fun, you know. They laugh a lot. They're giggly. They they they're like cuddly. They just want to play. They all they want to do is play, and um, and you have to play with them. Like they they they're not like um, they don't want to play by themselves. If you're in the room, they want to play with you. <laughs> so so I I try to um, follow a kind of Buddhist tenet that you know, terrible things happen and we have to deal with them and we have to be present to deal with them, but we don't have to suffer. There's a difference between dealing and suffering and you don't have to suffer. You can be serious and get a lot of important things done and deal with very difficult challenges and um, keep your equanimity, that's the Buddhist concept, and, um, and not suffer even while you're in challenging situations. Um, well, uh, you know, kids poop a lot too, and that <laughs> caused, caused me to suffer, so I, I have to look elsewhere. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> It's true, they want you to take them to the bathroom yeah, to yeah. change it's, their diapers it's, it's, yeah, as well as play. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I, I agree with the, the basic sentiment. Um, <laughs> I'm sure kids are pleased. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, for me, in terms of inspiration, I mean, I take uh, a great deal of inspiration for, from, you know, the folks who somehow, in this moment of hope and heartbreak, uh, keep going. I mean, I, I can't tell you, you know, kind of to Rinku's point, how many times, you know, you go to a community, it's terrible, oh my God, this awful stuff is happening. I was just in New Orleans and, you know, the Katrina, you know, you're looking out the window, look at these people, they're suffering, it's so awful, God, what kind of country are we? And, you know, and then you get there and they're partying and having a great time. And, you know, you know, we can sometimes get a little, little strange. So. Um, so I take a lot of inspiration from ordinary people. I also, um, you know, I play. With, I still play with my action figures. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, which ones? Which ones? Yeah. The Star Wars, Star Wars one. Hasbro. Has, well, I can't. Hasbro. I keep, I keep talking <laughs> corporations. Somebody get me out of here. Um, uh, well, I'll tell you later. But the but the but the, but the point is simply this. For a couple of years, uh, when I was at the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, uh, Jay Imani and uh, Ying Sun Ho and Ian and um, uh, uh, Samantha and some of us would just spend time in the afternoon literally just playing. Uh, and uh, on the clock, but playing and thinking. Uh, what, what? <laughs> anyway. Um, some, some new employees. You want to go work there. Uh, yeah. No, some new employees are saying, we ain't playing no, no more. We, Jay working us. Uh, no, I'm sure you guys are having a good time. But my, my point is that uh, it was out of that that we came up with the whole green jobs framework. We weren't deliberately 
going at it, we just created an atmosphere where we were able to uh, not have our face up against the furnace of the prison uh, industry all the time. And we started asking the question, what happens when these kids come home? And what could we do when these kids come home from prison? Because we're gonna win these fights. And we came up with the green jobs piece. And so for me, I think that um, continuing to, to, to play, continuing to engage with things that are not directly political, but that still have that kind of mythic narrative quality, uh, like science fiction, um, uh, mythology, all those things help me a great deal. And uh, I encourage people to kind of, you know, let your geek flag fly a little bit more. <laughs> Uh, I think what's what's inspiring me right now, and it's it's going to be a little heavy again, sorry. But um, but what's inspiring me right now at the moment, in this moment where we feel like hope is lost, and as progressives we don't know where to look for for inspiration, and we think that America is going down the wrong path. I see 800,000 dream activist kids, who, for all intents and purposes, are American. They believe so much in the American dream, and we're not seeing their hope that they see in our country as a possibility. So they're the ones that inspire me. So thank you to the dream activists and the ones that are in the room. Okay. Um, I'll lighten it up a little bit. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, now that Van has, has uh, acknowledged playing with action figures, I can't wait to see how Glenn is going to spin that one. He's, he said, you know, he's not going to tell you which, I'm sure it's the Bill Ayers uh, action figure that, uh, that you... Uh, how did you know? I know, I know, I know. Um, in any event, um, so here, you know, the, the, the deeper answer, I mean, the more sort of political answer is I'm inspired by all these folks who've gone before who, you know, who kept doing it no matter what the odds were and not one of whom really thought that they were going to see justice, final justice, right? Because it's not this looming finish line where you cross it and then you're done and then you retire, you know. Um, it's this constant struggle. And so I'm inspired by that because if those folks who have paid the price, both folks of color and white allies through history, have done that, and I'm really in no position to say, I think I'm tired and I think I'll take a break now, you know. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, it is my kids, um, poop and all, you know. And, and, uh, and, and, and what's incredible about children, I mean, first of all, you just learn um, when you're a parent all these things that you realize just how utterly incompetent you are in so many ways. And as you're observing them, figuring out everything and asking you questions about everything, you know, where does rain come from and why and how does the grass grow and where did that tree come from and of course, you know, the problem of course with white men is we've just like got to have an answer. We, we can never just say, hmm, I don't know, let's look that up. I think um, that's men. Yeah, it's, I think it's men generally, but I think it's also there's a white, it's like we, we're the authority, I, I'll tell you even though what I'm telling you is total crap. Um, so, but what's cool about kids is when you do observe them learning all this stuff, you realize that and you're transmitting things to them that you don't realize you're transmitting, right? I don't mean the knowledge that you give them when they ask you a question. I mean like our littlest, we have a third grader and a first grader, and so when the littlest was in kindergarten last year, so the week after MLK, um, they're in class, and the kindergarten teacher is you know, wanting to do something related to the holiday, right? So she pulls up a sound file of the I Have a Dream speech, right? And she's like, we're gonna listen to this famous speech that." Martin Luther King Jr. gave him. My daughter got this really sort of screwed up look on her face and, and she's like, I don't think we ought to do that. Now, you gotta understand, the teacher's like, wait a minute, your dad like <laughs> does this like, you know, she's thinking, why is this kid like anti Martin Luther King Jr.? But that's not where Rachel was coming from. Of course, her thing was, I don't think we should sit here and listen to this you know, old recording on a computer. I think we need to go march around the school. <laughs> and we need to, we need to have protest signs and we need to have a peace and justice mark. I had not put her up to this. I had not told, I was out of town. I can take no response, no, you know, no, I never said like, you know, go protest and demonstrate. No, but she was like six and she's saying, no, this is just not sufficient. We, we must do more. And so they literally, and they go, so, I mean, what's cool about that is you realize that even when you're not and I think maybe especially when you're not sitting drumming it into your kid, because that actually, you know, kid, you know what kids do then, they just turn on you, right? So, um, but when you, when you just sort of naturally exude a set of values 
You don't realize how that stuff gets ingrained in children. Not only your own, but if you're a teacher, teaching other folks' children, if you're someone's you know, aunt or uncle or, or, or you know, whatever, um, you have this incredibly profound, very scary, very dangerous if used incorrectly, but this very profound power. And that's what sort of allows me to think that this struggle that we're engaged in, though we're not gonna see the end of it, is, is, is all the more worth engaging in because you begin to see that there are these people coming after you and they're actually more prepared than you think to pick up the, the mantle of whatever needs to be done and to do it. So that's incredibly inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. You know what? It won't take long, but I have to just say that um, I'm really inspired by my colleagues at the Applied Research Center. And um, I just find it so fun to work with that crew of people. I'm so blown away by their creativity and their dedication and and their stamina. It's like, you know, people at ARC really can keep going for a long time. And, uh, you know, I may not get another chance to say it publicly, so I want to say it here. They really keep me going and... Um, and uh, they deserve in enormous thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have about four minutes left. So okay. I'm going to ask each of you to take one minute. One minute. <laughs> one minute, Dougie Fresh. Um, and tell us where do you think our side is actually gaining traction and how we might build on that? The positive future. Where are we moving? What can we do? I think that uh, many, many, many huge numbers of people are extremely concerned about the racial um, gap and about um, the, the about racial conflict. And even if they don't know, even if they haven't come all the way to our policy solutions or the way that we talk about things, our frames, uh, I am really convinced that there is a huge constituency for racial justice in this country. I think this conference, its attendance, um, the fact that I can, we can have done it three times and have people here who um, are attending it for the first time and who are asking me, four people asked me today, what, where is it going to be in 2012? It's New York, uh, November 2012. Uh, I think there's a lot of evidence that there are people of all colors who are very invested in the racial justice project in this country and um, I'm looking forward to working with all of them. Cool. That's good. You don't have to clap. <laughs> but we love you, Sam. Exactly. Um, I think a couple things. One is just kind of big picture. This is a, a pro-democracy movement that we're a part of uh, in a struggle with real authoritarians. That's what's happening. It's a pro-democracy movement. It's a tug of war. And it's a democracy. So it, we, we, it's two steps forward, one step back. It's not going to be linear. But we absolutely revolutionized and reinvented politics uh, between 2004 and 2008. And that is what has terrified these people. Uh, let's not forget, they're not acting this way because we suck. Okay? They're not acting this way because we, we're not powerful. They're acting this way because we are. So now, because we were successful, they've now gone and they've innovated. And they're throwing stuff at us that we're not ready for. Our, my prediction is November will be our low point. It will also be their high point. Once we get past November, then they're going to have to play some role in sharing in governance. And then they're going to have, that will be 2011. And then 2012, they'll have their nasty little primary, which will basically be mean people fighting dumb people. That's going to be their <laughs> primary. Sometimes they're both, right? Um, Sometimes mean and right? dumb. Yeah. So, after about two more years of this stuff, we're going to start looking really good to people again. Um, and we better be ready. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. This is not a left-wing period. It's not a right-wing period. It is a volatile period. We are in a volatile period. And the team that can keep its head in the game, that can continue to, to innovate, 
that can stay centered and focused will prevail. And that is completely in our hands. It's not anybody else's hands. Uh, they've got the momentum right now. They'll have it for a while. They'll, they will make mistakes and we'll have more opportunities. Now, I want to say that I love Ella Baker. I helped to create an organization named after Ella Baker. But I took some very bad advice from Ella Baker. Ella Baker had a slogan. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. I took that slogan way too seriously for way too long in my life. And I paid for it in an emotional breakdown, a spiritual breakdown, a physical breakdown. Okay? So there may be people here who are feeling, yeah, let's go, let's get them. And there may be people who are feeling, I'm tired. And we sometimes create a culture where that's not okay. Yeah. Now, we can take it too far, or we can get onto some you know, real bourgeois stuff, but most of you, that's not your problem. Yeah. Most of you, that's not your problem. And I want to say that we are, we, 2008 was not the finish line of anything. If anything, it was the starting line. And we're going to have to spend the next 20 to 30 years uh, governing this country from the bottom up when we have to, from the bottom up and top down when we can, but absolutely redirecting a nation to finally live out its creed of liberty and justice for all. If you need to sit down and take a water break, that's all right. <laughs> That's all right. It's a marathon. It's a marathon. It's all right. I, mean, I have to agree with both Rinku and with Van that we are in a period of, I think part of the reason that the last two years have been so difficult was because we did get tired, right? We're like, Psh, done, right? But politics is not a one any game, and I think sometimes we forget that. So we do need to start energizing, but the election of Barack Obama was not by accident. It was thoughtful, methodical, and strategic. And we have to remember that in the next two years, we have to be thoughtful, methodical, and strategic. And that includes taking breaks every once in a while, but also having conversations and bringing people in. Because one of the ways that the Tea Party is being so effective right now is that they're having that conversation with their next door neighbor. We stopped having that conversation. So I, I, keep, I keep envisioning the great schlep that Sarah Silverman did. How many people saw that, the great schlep? That made the difference in Florida. Uh -huh. That's what's gonna make the difference in our neighborhood and not to be afraid to have those conversations. And, you'll, and what I found, at least in my journey, is the most unlikeliest of allies once we started reaching out. So with that, I see incredible hope. And the fact that you guys are here, get to work, but I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. And in addition to all that, you know, as a, as a white aspiring ally trying to work with white folks in particular around the country to sort of build or help to build solidarity and, and the connections between white activists and folks of color, the thing in the, in the 15 years that I've been traveling doing that and the 20 years that I've been doing it overall is, and, and what I'm seeing that's hopeful, I'm not going to say that it's... Uh, at that point where you can go, oh, how wonderful, we can sort of you know, not worry about it. But, but what's hopeful to me in that period is that there is an increasing willingness, and I see it every week somewhere in this country, and not like the usual suspect places where you'd expect to see this, but I'm seeing white folks in rural communities and urban communities in the South, in the Midwest, in the Northeast, in the Pacific Northwest, West Coast, Southwest, all over the country, who are doing two things. Number one is they're really engaging this question for the first time about their own institutional advantages and, and institutional racism. And they're engaging it not merely from this charity, I want to solve this for other people place, right, which is sort of inherently paternalistic and creates all types of problems when you're trying to build movements, but are actually beginning to ask these questions about what institutional white supremacy is doing to us, what it is doing to our people, to our community, to our bodies, to our soul, to our humanity. When, when white folks begin to ask that question, it's as powerful as when men begin to question patriarchy because of what it does to us. When straight folks begin to question straight supremacy because of the box that it puts us in, in terms of what is acceptable and non-acceptable um, identity, right? So that when we 
begin to ask that question, we become very dangerous because that is the point at which we stay in the game. You keep your head in the game when you realize it's about you, when you realize that your life, literally your humanity, everything that matters to you is on the line. If I'm doing it for you, I can take that break and make it permanent. If I'm doing it for you, I can say, wow, I'm really busy this week. I think I'm going to pick a different subject. <laughs> if I realize that my life is at stake and I have a very short period in which to live this life, so I better make some decisions and I better make some commitments. And I'm telling you, I'm not seeing enough of it, but you know what? We, we, you never have to have 50% plus one in, this, in, this, in any culture That's to get changed. What you need is enough. I don't know what enough is. I know it is more than we have now, but it is less than a majority. So we have a lot of work to do. And the good news is there are people who are beginning to engage in that very personal way which is going to make them effective at doing institutional change and activism and that's incredible. Okay, please join me in just uh, thanking the panelists one more time and then I'm going to turn it over to Chris. And thank you, Kathy. So, um, Brian wants a photo of all of us. Kathy, this way.